a year of the grace revival. And I'm going to get into this because so much of us have tried to put our own efforts in there, and it's grace and grace alone. And we, we, because we have put our own efforts into it, the law, and trying to keep stuff and trying to do stuff on our own, it has driven out grace, and it's been us works. It's just us. It's not Jesus plus us. It's Jesus plus nothing, which equals everything. It's grace and grace alone that saves you. It's grace and grace alone that keeps you. So God says, I want to bring him back. I want to bring my church back because it's important to bring you guys back because it's important because the world needs us. The world looks down upon us now because they think we're a bunch of money-hungry people. They think that we're so scandalous and that we try to reason it and we have these false miracles and these false things. We offer false hope to the world, to everybody. Until we start to realize his grace and his grace is not just to save us but to keep us and to keep us and strong us, the world will start to look up to us. They will see us as God sees us. And they will start moving towards us. And they say, you're the only hope that's in this world. It's you, the church. And that's why God wants to bring us back. And we're going to bring it back today. So revival, I like definitions. I like doing all kinds of stuff. A revival means an insistence of something becoming popular, active, important, or comeback. It makes a comeback. Grace was so prominent in the early church, the first church. Paul wrote three-fourths of the whole New Testament, and all he preached was grace. The man had an education based on religion, not grace. And when he got knocked off his horse, he saw the eyes of grace. He saw the grace for the first time, and that is Jesus Christ. And then from that forth on, the church never even really understood grace, because if you look in book of Acts, they were still trying to keep the law by circumcision and in some parts of the law. But when Paul stepped up, that was the point when the church made a step in to grace. And you can see that we're going to look at some of that stuff because there's been troubles in the church from that point which Paul had to fight against. And says, uh-uh, it's grace. Not grace plus the law, it's just grace itself. So we're going to look into that. So let's pray, guys. Father, we just thank you so much. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this whole new year that we have before us because 2014 is gone past, but 2015, 2015 is here, and we know this is a revival. We're bringing us back to where we need to be so we can be the hope for the world as we are always supposed to be. And Father, we just thank you so much that you had this wonderful word that may go forth into the minds of your people, not just sit in this room, but all who watch and listen to the sermon, Father God, in Jesus' name. And we just thank you so much. And I pray for each individual person that is in here that as they leave the room, they not be thinking of themselves, but thinking of Jesus Christ and be holding to Jesus and being transformed to his image outwardly. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Alright, <clears throat> so there's been, you look at, there's been so many different types of revivals throughout the years, right? And one of the most, most common things I always hear is sin stops revival. Most of most things I always heard, sin always stops the revival. Well, I got a newsflash. If sin stopped the revival, it would have never been a revival. He says we're sin abound, grace super balance, right? But before we get into all that, Romans 1.16 16 to 17, this is what this ministry is based upon. I know so many people have used this scripture out of context in the way to prove, in a sense, I am so proud to be a Christian. That's cool, but this is not what it says. It is the message which is preached by the church. For Paul says, was so eager to preach to the Romans, the Roman church, he says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power, God's power working unto salvation. For deliverance from eternal death to everyone who believes with a personal trust and confidence, surrender, and firm reliance to the Jew first and also to the Greeks. It first came to the Jews and then it went to the world. Right? For in the gospel, this is the most important thing. This is the, what Paul preached. This was the center of his whole entire message. For the gospel, in the gospel, a righteousness which God ascribes is revealed, not ascribed by the law, but by his grace, right? Both springing from faith and leading to faith. It's not from work to faith or works to works or faith to works. It's faith to faith. Just from one believing to the next believing, right? This goes through the way of faith that rises to more faith. As it written, the man who through faith is just and outgoing shall live and shall live by faith. I love how Paul put that. How you live by faith is believing that you're righteous by God. In Christ Jesus. This is the message. Right? Paul was so excited about preaching this. It was about him being a Christian, which he was never ashamed of. You can see that. But he wasn't ashamed to go out and preach this. Because you know what? Everything in the world and all religions are against us. 
even Judaism. Okay? It's all against this message. He says, but you know what? I don't care. If I'm the only person in the whole entire world who says, I'm on a shame. You can all come against me. I don't care. Okay? I'm going to stand for what it is. I'm going to stand for God. I'm going to stand for the grace of God. I don't care what you say to me. I'm going to preach it. Okay? Now, like I said before, so many things that people have said that grace stops revivals and, and you know, sin stops the revivals and stuff. I have a newsflash, and so many times they say, you fall from grace because you sin. Well, let's look at that, because that's the first part. Let's go to Galatians 5, 1 through 4, and pretty soon, in a couple weeks, we're going to go through the whole book of Galatians. I like going word for word. That's just me. I love reading scriptures. I love seeing allowing God to bring up the truth and reading stuff in context. Context is king, right? If you take the text out of the, of the context, you're left with a con. You can be misled. The devil loves that when you take out. He does that all the time. It's called a partial truth with a lie. He does that all the time. He did that with Adam and Eve in the garden. We see that, right? So we gotta read the context, we gotta read scripture in context. So let's start in verse one. In this freedom has in freedom, Christ has made us free and completely liberate us. It's talking about the gospel, <coughs> grace. Stand fast then, and do not be a hamper and hell a snare and submit again to a yoke of slavery which you have once put off. Religion, the law, everything. And we'll get into that too because it actually calls it. God himself calls it administration of death. He calls it administration of condemnation. Who wants to be under that? I don't, personally. I spent too many years under that. Actually, before I was any Christian, I spent myself in bondage to trying to play religion anyways. Thinking that my works... If I had more good things than bad things, I would get myself in heaven. And I fell miserably. And then when I became a Christian, I tried to, tried to play religion again. Fell miserably. Now I'm on the grace, I'm not falling anymore. So, notice, it is I, Paul, who tells you that if you receive circumcision, the law, right, Christ will be, be of no profit, no advantage avail to you, for if you distrust him, you can gain nothing from him. This law, trying to keep law, does nothing for you. It's not the one who justifies you. We learned that last week. It says the law was never meant to justify a man. It can never justify you before God. Actually, what Paul wrote in Romans, he says that actually the law points to Christ. Wow. And he says the prophets point to Christ. Interesting, right? Elijah and Moses appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration. And as he appeared, when Peter woke up from his sleep, was sleep a lot in the Bible, it seems like. He saw the Elijah and Moses backing away from Christ. They point to him, but they're not the main person. They're not. Because it is one, it's God, Jesus alone, right? It's grace and grace alone. Grace is not. It's not a message, it's a person. Jesus. Verse 3. I once more protest and testify to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation bound to practice the whole law in his ordinance. If you're going to try to keep the law, keep the whole entire law. And Paul says, do it. Stop trying to, to do, keep some of it and say, I'm the rest of it by grace. Because you're going to end up in the cycle of mixture. Jesus said in the book of Revelations, he is hot, hot or cold, I'd rather you be, but if you're lukewarm, I spit you out. Because if you're lukewarm, a lukewarm Christian, you're trying to mix the law and grace together and you'll never know. You're in, this, in the cycle. But if you're completely cold, completely on the law, you're going to come to the end of yourself and says, I need a savior. He says, you're hot, it means you're all full in grace. Because if he says it's saved nasty, he will spit the hot water out too. Right? Or spit the cold water out. It's just lukewarm. You try to mix the two together. You just end this, in this dirty cycle that you're playing this religion and you just get burnt out. Man, I'm telling you. Been there. Been there before. Now I like this part. If you seek to be justified and clear righteous and to be given a right standing with God, through the law. If you're trying to keep the law, you are brought to nothing and so separate from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Wow. We have heard so much that if you to fall from grace is a sin. God just told us right here to fall from grace is to go back to your own effort. Go back to the law, therefore you walk away from grace. Picture the mercy seat, the ark covenant, right? The mercy seat is God's grace. He sprinkled the blood on it because he always wants to see what's underneath. What's underneath it is the law, the Ten Commandments, Aaron's bud, rod, his budded rod, and the, a, man, a pot of man, right? 
it all represents God, a man's disobedience to God. We, we rejected his provision, we rejected his leadership, we rejected his law. We can't meet either one of them, right? All three. He sprinkles the blood on it so he can't see it, right? The blood, the blood of Jesus washes it all away. But you think about it, the law is underneath the mercy seat. Picture this. You go back in the law, you jump off the mercy seat and you try to go under. Hence, grace is so much higher than the law. Okay? This is where we need to get need to get back up here. We need to step out of our own self efforts and get up here. Say, Jesus, you did it all, right? And let's go to Second Corinthians because I want to show you something. Because actually, the law itself wants to go away. It actually has served its purpose and in, in its, its time here on earth, and it wants to go away. But why do we keep trying to pull it back? Why? I don't. I don't understand because I, it. You're only doing setting yourself up. But I'm going to show you that. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I love this chapter. Because it reveals so much. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. I love how Paul is today and reveals Christ in the midst of it all. Because Jesus is the center of all. He is the scriptures. If you don't see Christ while you're reading it, you're not, re you're not reading the Bible. You're just reading it for knowledge. You're hidden knowledge. And that's it means nothing to you. It won't profit you anything. Unless you see Jesus Christ, therefore it will now profit you something. Well, let's start here because I wanted to keep everything here because there's something really good here. The Jew, the Jew they, they call them Judaizers who are saved Christians but going around saying it's, it's okay to be saved by grace but what you need, then once you're saved then you have to keep the law to keep your salvation. To keep your right standing with God, you got to keep the, the, the Ten Commandments, right? This is what they were going around to. Right behind Paul, as Paul preached, he came behind them. He had, they had entered into the Corinthian church, the, the Corinth church. And they, what they did was to make themselves look good, they brought letters from Jerusalem to show their accreditation, to make them look so good, right? Watch this. Are we starting to commend ourselves again? Or do we not like some false teachers need written credentials or letters of recommendations to you? Or from you. Do we? Oh, yes. Know you yourselves are a letter of recommendation written in your hearts and to be known and ready for it by everybody. I, I never went to Bible school. I don't have accreditation to say I should be a pastor. I have none of that. But you. You being transformed shows my validation that I'm in Christ. That I'm walking in the grace that God has provided me. Your transformation reflects on me as a pastor. And it reflects on Him. And Paul says, you are my evidence that I am preaching what God has for us. I don't need man's written letter. I have it written on the hearts. <coughs> you show and make obvious that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us. Not written with ink, not, not um, of this world, but with the, spirit, with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but tablets of the human heart. I love that. He, he just put an emphasis. The spirit is in your heart, not written on the stone. Why do we look to something that's cold in the, of this world than looking at what's within that's internal and it can never be changed? Right? So the comparison begins for Paul. Such is the reliance and confidence that we, we have through Christ toward and with reference to God. Not that we are fit. I love that. We are not qualified of ourselves to form personal judgments or declaim or count anything that's coming from us but the power and ability and sufficient of our phone, God. My letters are you. I, I'm not qualified to be up here but God has graced me to be here. It's by the grace of God I am who I am. I labor above, above everybody else, above all the apostles. But it wasn't I, but it was the grace of God. He's saying the same thing here. It's the power of God, right? Saying that. It is he who has qualified us, making us to be fit and worthy and sufficient as ministers and dispensers of a new covenant. New covenant, not old. New. We'll show you the new covenant as we go down, too. Of salvation through Christ, not ministers of the letter. I love this. Of Christ. Ministers of Christ, not of the law. Not ministers of the letter, but of the spirit. For the code of the law kills. Wow, he just tells you that it kills. Wow. The, the law is holy. Don't get me wrong. It is holy and righteous in its own way, right? And that's if you keep it perfectly. And that means with your mind as well. But none of us can. 
that's the part we all fail in is with our minds. Do we always put God first in our minds? No. You already broke the first law, and James says you break the first, you break one law, you break it all. You're done. Doom. It kills. It's condemnation. It ministers condemnation because as you fail and break and miss a step, the devil comes in and condemns you. Right? The devil loves the law because he wants to tempt you to try to keep it because he knows you will fall short in it. And as soon as you fall short, he hits you with a hammer. He says, gotcha. Now you're mine. I got you now. That's the way he did to Adam and Eve because there was only one law in the garden. It was not the other tree. And he tempted them to eat the tree because he could easily attempt them to kill one another, but it wasn't a law. Mm. All right, we're almost up. So it's a Christ, not a law. But the Holy Spirit makes us alive. This new covenant is the Holy Spirit, right? It's the promise that which God had promised, which none of the Old Testament saints never received. But you and I are so special to receive it. Hallelujah. Right? They were actually never, when they're on this earth, were never physically alive in a sense. Because you only have life in Christ. Now they do. But at the time here on this earth, they didn't. They all were in faith faith, but they never received the promise. How amazing. Now, this, this, this is dispensation of death. Wow. Called this, now he's calling it death. Wow. Engraved in letters on stone. You tell me, what was the only thing engraved on stone? Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. He just called it the ministration of death. The ministration that kills. Was inaugurated with such glory and splendor that the Israelites were not able to look steadily at the face of Moses because of his brilliance, a glory that was to fade and pass away. I want you to know that fade and pass away. It has glory, but it was to fade and pass away. I want you to notice that. Because we're going to get into some scriptures where it shows that it's supposed to go away. We're supposed to allow it to go away. Step into grace and just live by grace, by what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Why should not this dispensation of the Spirit, this is spiritual ministry whose task is to cause men to obtain and govern by the Holy Spirit, be attended with much greater, more splendid glory? He's saying the new covenant has more glory. This grace, this Holy Spirit that is ministered by Him has more glory, people. Why do you want to go do something that has less glory when something has more glory? He's saying you're, you're just, you don't understand. This is better. Okay? For if the service that condemns, now he just called it the ministry of the condemnation, the ministry of doom, I love that, the ministry of doom, had glory, how infinitely more bounty and splendor and glory must be the service that makes righteous, the ministry that produces and false righteous living and right standing with God. It's only by grace. Only grace produces right living. See, so many people have taken the law of, the law of Moses or the Ten Commandments and tried to use that as a way to produce right living. He's saying that it's only through the new covenant, the grace of God, that you can even live right. It's when you believe right, you transform your mind to this, you can start living right. You believe right, you will live right. Indeed, in view of this fact, what once was had splendor, the law, the glory of the law in the face of Moses, has come to have no splendor at all. Because of the OM glory that exceeds and excels it, glory of the gospel in the face of Jesus Christ. Y'all remember on the um, Mount Transfiguration that he also shines so glorious, right? When, which is interesting. When Moses went up to Mount Sinai, when he came down, everybody ran from him. When, when Jesus went up the Mount, on Mount Transfiguration, and when he came down, everybody ran to him. Mm. Two different ministries. Two different ministries. For if that which was but passing and fading away came with splendor, how much more must that which remains in its permanent abide in glory and splendor? Paul keeps trying to tell him, and this is twice now, he says, it has more glory and more splendor. That which the law is had its glory and splendor in its days. But the fulfillment has happened. Jesus Christ has died on the cross and the fulfillment is complete of the law. Since we have such glorious hope, we speak freely, openly, and fearlessly. I am unashamed of this gospel again, he's saying. I love it. Nor do we act like Moses. I love this. He's about to put Moses down just a couple of notches because these Judaizers are putting the Moses up here. He's about to say, 
He's down here. Who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites not, may, might not gaze upon the finish of the vanity he slain. The only reason why they put the veil on Moses because it was a glory that was fading away. And they did not want to see it fade away. That's the only reason why I did I love how Paul brings it out, reveals the truth which was hidden in the old. It availed it so that they wouldn't see it vanish. Because you know what happened? When they came to Mount Sinai, from, from, the, from the first Passover, they came out by the blood of the Lamb, right? It wasn't by their own efforts. It was because God delivered them, right? From that point to Mount Sinai, they murmured and complained so many times, right? No one died. I want you to go back and look at your Bible. No one actually died from the murmur and complaining. God delivered them every single time. You know how stupid their complaint could have been? He still delivered them. And when they came before Mount Sinai, he, he presented them. He goes, will you do everything I say you can do? You know what they foolishly said? In such prideful and arrogance. In Hebrew, it's the most arrogant, prideful language they could ever spoke. Words they could spoke. It says, we can do it. As if we done everything else. We deliver our own selves, God. So you know what? Whatever you tell us, we can be more than satisfied to do that. We can meet it. What pride and arrogance they had towards God. God says, and you notice that part, God didn't step away. He says, don't come towards the mount or you die. Or even your cattle that comes nearby is going to die. God changed the stance for them. Okay? When he came down, they didn't want to see that fading and that glory disappear. Because they were underneath a grace covenant. They were underneath the covenant of Abraham. And they stepped into a whole new covenant. The covenant of law. And if you think the law is so glorious, right after he gave the law, he, then he gave a system of sacrifices. Because he knew man was going to fail every time. Therefore, God would have to see man's failure. They would have to do something that reminded him of what his son was going to do. Alright. So in fact, their minds were grown hard and callous. They had become dull and had lost power of understanding. For until this present day, when the Old Testament is talking to the Jewish people, the Testament is read, being read, the same veil still lies on their hearts because they didn't want to see the grace disappearing. They didn't want to see this glory. A veil never lies on their hearts. They totally rejected the Messiah, the, the Deliverer, when he was stood before them. The personified, the personality, the photography of God, the photograph of God, who God really is, this grace, they rejected. The same veil lies, still lies on their hearts, not being lifted to reveal that in Christ is made void and done away. There is no veil in Christ. It's all open. Come home. You can step into the Holy Holies because God says you're right with me. It's the whole point of him making you righteous in Christ so you can be with him. Yes, during this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies upon their minds and hearts. But whenever a person turns in repentance, it changes their mind. Repentance in the Bible, it's metanoia in the Greek. It means change of mind. Not a physical thing, as you see in the Old Testament, them tearing their clothes. But it's metanoia, it means change of mind. To the Lord, the veil is stripped off and taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and with the Spirit of the Lord is there is liberty. I like that. Where, where the Holy Spirit resides in you, He's inside of you as a believer. There's liberty. There's freedom. He didn't say where the law is, there's liberty. He said, no, where the spirit is, there's liberty. Separation. Two different things. Now, I mentioned this yesterday, or last week. The law points you to yourself and allows you to only see your own self. Where grace points you to Jesus Christ. It doesn't say look at your own self. It says, no, look what he has done. Right? The law says, look at your own self and look at your shortcomings. You keep falling short. Where grace says, Here's Jesus Christ. Now watch this. All of us, as with unveiled face, because we continue to behold in the Word of God, as in near the glory of the Lord, the glory of the Lord is Jesus, are constantly being transfigured to, into His very own image, and every increasing splendor from our from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Remember on the Mount Transfiguration, what was inside of Jesus came out, right? Well, that's the same that happens to you and I. We are made in Christ. We're made whole and complete, perfect, righteous, without blemish, everything, right? That's who we really truly are, a spirit. 
what we see in this body is just a body made of dust. When we look at Jesus as Jesus is, so we in this world, and as we look at him, the image that which is inside of us starts to come out. Just like in the Mount Transfiguration. For all the world to see this bright glory come out. I saw New Creation Church in Singapore. They had this, this cool, they had an awesome service, which is today, which was yesterday for us, <laughs> where they had the mirror man. They had put mosaic tile all over this jacket and his mask. And I didn't get to see the whole thing. I just got to see pictures. And when the, they shined the light on it, it was so bright, right? Man, it just lit the whole place up because they reflected out. The glory of the light reflected out. So as we see Jesus, the light reflects out of us for everybody to see. Two different ministrations because the law only points you to yourself where grace points you to Jesus. It comes reflection out. That's where we need to be. As we stay under the law, and we only show ourselves to people. But when we live life under grace, we reflect Him now. Okay? Now notice how the law says is passing away, which was glory, was to be done away with and pass away. I got some scripture that actually shows that. I love it. Now, Luke 2, after before this, Jesus was born, right? He was born and all the shepherds, the shepherds came and all the la 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 fun stuff, right? Well, according to the law, Joseph and Mary had to take their son to be circumcised. They had to take him to the temple. She had to be cleansed because she just gave birth. She gave out blood. According to the law, you had to come to the temple to be cleansed, right? And they had to present a sacrifice. Their sacrifice showed state. It says Jesus was, became poor, right? Their sacrifice reflected that. Because on the law, the first, if you have money, you bring a lamb. And it goes so on. And the most cheapest thing you can ever bring was turtle doves. And they brought two turtle doves to ask their sacrifice. It showed that they were impoverished. They were poor. Aren't you glad Jesus was born poor so that we could be made rich? All right. Now, they're going to the temple. This is a nice, beautiful encounter, but it had, we, we just kind of glossed over it. Because it actually has a hidden meaning. Everything has a hidden. God has something hidden there. He just wants you to allow him to show it to you. So I'll just... Allow him to show it to you as a read. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, cautiously and carefully observing the divine law. Notice it says cautiously and carefully according to law. Okay? And looking for the consolation of Israel, the Messiah. And the Holy Spirit was upon him and had been divinely revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ or the Messiah. And prompted by the Holy Spirit, he came into the temple. In closure, and when the parents brought in, in the little child, Jesus, to do, to do for him what was customary according to the law, Simeon, he wasn't supposed to do this, by the way, took him up in his arms, took Jesus up in his arms, and praised and thanked God and said, And now, Lord, you are releasing your servant to the part in peace according to your word. For with my own eyes I have seen your salvation, or in Hebrew, Yeshua, which is your ordained prepared before all peoples. By the way, Yeshua is the Hebrew form. Jesus is actually a Greek word that we use. If you want to do the English word, it's actually Joshua. The English word of Yeshua. And light for the revelation to the Gentiles, to disclose what was before unknown, and to bring praise and honor to glory to your people Israel. And his legal father and his mother were marveling at what, he had, what was said about him. And somebody blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this Christ, this Christ is born and destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is spoken against. And a sword will pierce through his, your own soul also that the secret thoughts and purpose of many hearts may be brought out and disclosed. He's the first one to actually call him the Christ. Notice that. If you look at the Jewish study of the name Simeon, in Hebrew it actually means law. It comes from the root word law. You ever notice that Jacob had 12 sons, and the first son was Simeon, right? <coughs> he lost his inheritance. <coughs> Remember? The law can never inherit the, 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 what God has for man. You can't inherit the prized possession of what God has. It's only through grace, right? 
we also see that a lot. You saw the firstborn always miss out on the inheritance. Adam missed out on the inheritance, and Jesus the second Adam, which we all get through, right? But Simeon, the law can never do it. Notice that he took him up and praised God, and he says, now you're releasing your servant to depart. Simeon actually represents the law. When grace came, Jesus says, I can more happily just pass away now. I can depart in peace according to your word. I can go home now. Grace is here. I'm no longer needed. I've done my job. Interesting, right? You got another one. In the Gospels as well. John 3. I love this part. This is John the Baptist. And some people would love this part. I love this part coming up because I, I see so many religious people just kind of use this thing to town, and I love it. I just start laughing when I see it more today because they know what I used to be one of those people too. All right, so John, he was baptized in the Jordan River. He had went up river. I think it was up river, and Jesus was down river. And so somebody came and asked him, says, are you sad that he's getting all the publicity now and you're just a little midget now? Really nobody really now. And John answered him. I love his answer. And man can receive nothing. He can claim nothing. He can take unto himself nothing except as it has been granted to him from heaven. And man must be, in, in, be content to receive the gift which was given him from heaven. There is no other source. Right? You yourselves are my witness. You personally bear me out that I say it. I'm not the Christ. But I have only been sent before him in advance of him to, to his appointed forerunner, his messenger, his announcer. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the groomsman who stands by and listens to him rejoices greatly and heartily on account of the bride's human voice. This is this then is my pleasure and joy and is now complete. That was the word complete there. This is the part that you will use so much. He must increase, so I may just decrease. We use that so much, right, for ourselves. But it's not even talking in the context of you and I. We'll get to that. He must grow more prominent and I must grow less. So he who comes from above is far above he who comes from the earth, belongs to the earth, and talks the language of the earth. His words are from the earthly standpoint, and he who comes from the earth is far above all others, far superior to all others in prominence and in ex excellence. It is to what he has actually seen and heard that he bears testimony, yet no one accepts his testimony, no one receives his evidence as true. Whoever receives his testimony has set his seal of approval to this, this. God is true. That a man is definitely certified and knowledge and clear once and for all and, and himself is sure that it is the divine truth that God cannot lie. For since he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, proclaims God's own message, God does not give him, him his spirit sparingly or by measure, but boundless, I love that, boundless, abundance, is the gift of God that makes of his spirit. The Father loves the Son and has given everything into his hands. His hand. And he who, who believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever disobeys or rejects Jesus, the Son would never see life. But instead, the wrath of God abides in him. God's displeasure remains on him. His indignation hangs over him. Notice that he says, I did my part. I was here to only to point to Christ. Right? Essentially, Jesus called him the grace of all the Old Testament prophets. Why? And the very law stated that the law points to Christ. Paul said that when we looked at last week, that the law points to Christ. He pointed everybody to Christ. He says, now because I've done that, I must increase now so that grace may increase. I must go away so that only prominent dominance is grace itself. And notice how he went through the testimony there. He was showing everybody that he who's above is far from a grave. The stone the Ten Commandments from stone came from the earth. It's lesser than when the, Jesus came from above. It says that the law was given through Moses, but trace, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The law was given through a third party. Not very, not very big. Because if I give a gift and say, tell this person to go give to this person, it's not very personal, is it? It's not. It's not. But when it came, Jesus itself, when if I give it to that person who was supposed to give it, it's very personal. When Jesus personally came, and he's talking about that. Grace came, I'm to believe, you're supposed to be dominant, right? More scripture. I got another one. I like a lot of scriptures because it always backs up. It makes it more truth. And you kind of see, when you see more of the same, 
it starts to make more sense, right? We talk about the new covenant, right? Hebrews 8 is the problem about the new covenant. And you also find in Hebrews 10, which talks of the Spirit, Holy Spirit speaking it to us and, and, and bearing witness to it for us, right? Which we'll get to the book of Hebrews too as well, because we're going to go line by line with that joke. I love the book of Hebrews, just as much as I love the book of Romans. Mm. Verse 7 says, For this, for if that first covenant had been without defect, the there would be had been no room for another another one or an attempt to answer to another one. If the, the covenant of law was so great and so perfect for man, for man, not for God, but for man, why did he make a new, a second, a new covenant? That should be a red flag for you and I, the church, say, why do we want to try to live under the old covenant still? Why do we want to bring any part of the old covenant to the new covenant when it is weak? Okay? However, he finds fault with them, showing the inaccuracy when he says, Behold, the days will come, says the Lord. This is a this was written in Jeremiah. Jeremiah prophesied the new covenant. Yes, and says, Lord, when I will make and ratify a new covenant agreement with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. This new covenant. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their forefathers in the day when I grasped them by the hand to help. Notice that it's outside. He grasped them by the hand. He literally had to drag them out of Egypt. He had to take them by the hands outside. In the old covenant, the Holy Spirit was never in. He was always upon outside. He always had to be on outside because he could never be on the inside, which is the foul. Mm -hmm. Right? We'll see that now God works from within. Help me relieve them and lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not abide my agreement with them. And so I withdrew my favor and disregard them and says, Lord, the old covenant said this, you do good, you get good. Do bad, you do bad. You get bad, right? That's basically sum it up, right? If you do bad, God lifts his protection on you. He's obligated to lift his protection on you. He has to. If so many translations, Old King James says, you know, he loud it or he he just makes it actually in the Greek in the Hebrew means he lifted it up. He was obligated. Right? Because man wanted a whole new covenant of God, God says, okay, fine, we'll live by that. We'll see how far you can go. And when you mess up, I have to pull back. Right? Because you're going. I have to count now count your transgressions against you. I have to back off. And whatever you've done, you have to reap what you sow now. Okay? He says, I found fault with that. Because I love you so much, I hate seeing you go through that, is what he's telling us. You, you kept on missing the mark. I never missed my mark, because I'm God and I'm perfect and holy, and I always do what I, I say. I'm always faithful. But I hate the fact that your faithfulness has not allowed you to suffer. I can't stand that. That's what God says. I can't stand that. I love you too much to leave you in that. I'm going to come and give you a new covenant. And that's through Jesus Christ, right? Let's read it. For this is the new co this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will imprint my laws upon their minds. And even upon their inmost thoughts and understanding, and engraving upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Notice everything is now within. Everything in the, the old covenant was always from the outside, because I had to grasp them from outside and pull them in. And he says, now everything is within. I get to work from you from within. Wow, amazing, right? Mm -hmm. So if you see a Christian who's born again today, stop trying to find fault with them. God's working from within to bring them outward. What's really in them, bring them out, okay? Stop judging. Stop taking snapshots of each other. Say, man, you, you just keep, you, you're just horrible. You know what? I, I got several people in here. I've seen your testimonies. I've seen you take from one spot, and I've seen you totally transform to another. You've seen Justin and Jonna, who sang up here. I can tell you right now, they just started coming in, in I think it was in August. Mm -hmm. I see a total transformation, in, especially in Jonna. You, you got to hear her testimony. She has come from a part where she's been condemned to hell and back again mm -hmm. forever. I've seen it totally change. They so much want to eager to do stuff for God so much. It's amazing the response. I have a couple back there who we, we've been through some tough times. But I can tell you right now, if I took a snapshot and condemned them from that and said this is basically who you are, I would have been wrong. All right, let's get back to it. I love that. I love the fact he says, I will be your God. Do you know what that means? It spells doom for the enemy. Anytime the old covenant, and he says, I will, I'm your God. I'm your God, it always spelled doom in the enemies. At that point, anybody who came against Israel was wiped out. Some of the most amazing ways where they fought against each other, where 
I mean, Hezekiah, number the they send out just the praise and worshipers to sing his mercy endures forever. Actually, in the Hebrew, it says his grace endures forever. That's all they did. They sang in front of him, and they all fall each other and wipe each other out. It's spelled doom for them, right? And he says, guess what? You're my people. Take that to heart. You're my people now. That means that before in the covenant law, because of your transgressions, you weren't my people. But now you are. It will never be necessary for each one to teach his neighbor and his fellow citizen or each one his own brother saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me. It's, it's on his back now. As a pastor, I can tell you each and every sermon, I can just relax. I can tell you when I got first, when my first when God called me to be a pastor, I was like, oh no, I got to tell him about God all the time. And God brought me to this. He goes, no, it's my job to tell him. My job to show them that there's a God, that I am who I am. I was like, thank you. I'm done now. I can sit back, sit back and relax. Lord, from the, from the smallest to the greatest, okay? That is one of the best parts of all this. That's all based upon for this simple fact. He can do all that for this simple reason. For I will be merciful and gracious toward their sins, and I will remember their deeds of unrighteousness no more. U me in the Greek. Never ever remember your sins ever again. Ever. Done deal. Because of that, I don't remember when Jesus Christ, because of that, I can do all this. Because I can now come in you because you're no longer defiled. You're made perfect in my image. Now I can really work with you. I can help you. You're stumbling there? It's okay. Don't go to law. Allow me to work for you. Allow me. Just keep seeing Jesus. Just keep seeing Jesus. And just be transformed. Keep seeing him as he is. So are you in this world. He's holy and righteous. So are you. I can work with you. I can work with you. Now what's amazing about the new covenant is the next part. When God speaks of a new covenant or agreement, he makes the first one obsolete. You heard about technology being obsolete. What does that mean? It's gone away with, right? And what is obsolete is right for disappearance and to be dismissed with all the other. No more. The law is supposed to be gone. And for the first, and also too, the law was never given to the Gentiles. It's only given to the Jews. Realize it. We're all Gentiles. Unless there's so many here who's Jewish. Of all Gentiles, well, guess what? You were never under the law in the first place. Also, too, Romans 6, it says, for sin, a noun. Actually, there's only two times. I got that one for you, buddy. Two times in the whole title of Romans that the word sin is used as a verb. It's rest used as a noun. Your state and being before God as a son. Sin. Sin, as a noun, has no dominion on you. We always stop there. Yeah. No, listen, it says, because you're not under the law, but you're under grace. Grace, law produces sin. It does. And that's the reason why it came. God gave it. To show that the Israelites, they were sinners. Because if at that point, Mount Sinai, he had said to them, here's Jesus Christ, the Savior of sinners, they would say, what's a sinner? What's that? They would say, what's that? So the purpose of the law was to say, you're a sinner. There's no righteousness in you. Your righteousness is like filthy rags before me. And you say, I need a Savior. He says, well, here's Jesus. The law always points to Jesus. So, for one, we're Gentiles and we were never given law. Let's make that clear. We're not Jewish, so why are we trying to live under the law in the first place? And under the law is the dominion of sin. Sin has dominion over you. It has power over you. It controls your life. It tells you what to do. You're like just a little puppet. and It's a puppeteer. You can actually take that word sin since they use it now and you can say the devil has no power over me. But I'm not under law, but I'm under grace. So powerful how you start to see that. And the truth is revealed, man, it sets you free. Where the spirit is, there is freedom. And the truth, you shall know the truth. Notice what Jesus said, you shall know the truth. He is talking to a bunch of Jewish people who know the law from the get time, from the time they are born. They are engraved. They are supposed to know the all five books books of Moses, right? Notice this five books of Moses. Five represents grace. They supposed to know inside and out. They knew the law. He says, but you don't know truth. Truth. He says, truth and grace came by Jesus Christ. That and were there in the Greek means that they are one the same. You don't know grace. And when you know grace, 
you shall be free. Talking about some people who knew law. They didn't know it. They actually didn't know God. And Bible law, you actually don't even know who God really is. I put a statement out this week and says, do you only know God by what you do? Or do you know by what he has done? Because by what he's done is what he truly is. If you base it on what you do for him, you'll never know God. You'll never know who he really is. You'll base it off about what you do. If you do good, you get good. If you do bad, you get bad. That sounds like the law. You got a newsflash. On the grace, by what he has done, do good, get good, do bad, get good. Doesn't sound right, does it? It's supposed to be different. Because the world even says, do good, get good, do bad, get bad. Totally opposite. Grace is not how this world, period. Like I said, let's go to the Old Testament. Because you can even see this here. There's a typology of Christ. There's actually Christ hidden here. We're going to look at Elijah and Elijah. If I said it right, I get it mixed up. Please forgive me, please. I get it mixed up. I get tongue twisted on these two. Um, names sometimes, but there's a big fine difference between the two of them. And I, I was sitting there talking to my wife again, talking to my wife. I heard so many people say revelation comes to me in the showers. Mine comes to talking to my wife. Thank God for my wife, man. <laughs> but talking to my wife one day, this came out. This literally just came out. I was like, whoa, Holy Spirit, man, that's good. Let me take notes, and I did. I was amazed what came out. So let's look at this. The prophet's sons who were, were at Bethel came to Elijah, Elijah and said, Do you know the Lord would take, take your master away from you today? He said, Yes, I know it. Hold your peace. Elijah said, Elijah said to Elijah, Stay here. Tari here. I would hate all you sometimes. Stay here. I pray you, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, Elijah replied, says, As the Lord lives, as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets were, who were at Jericho came to Elijah and said, do you, do you know that the Lord will take your master away from you? He said, he answered, yes, I know it. Hold your peace. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elijah were going to Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elijah, stay here, I pray you. I pray you. For the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elijah replied, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Just let you know, all these cities make sense. I actually urge you on your own to go check out the meetings of these. Actually, every name, every every name, it could be person name, city name, actually means something. You actually kind of see something there too as well. So we went down to Bethel. Elijah said to him, Stay here, I pray you, for the Lord has sent me. Notice he always says sent me. He didn't say sent you too. He sent me to Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, I will not leave you. And the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood to watch afar off. And the two of them stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the waters. And they divided this, this, divide this way and that. So the two of them went on dry ground, over on dry ground. By the way, the mantle always represents the Holy Spirit. And when they had gone over, Elijah said to Elijah, Ask what I shall do before I am before taken from you. Elijah said, I pray you, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Now we use this and say, oh, look, let God, let there be a double portion upon me. Right? I, I've seen that a lot, and I've been through that. And you know what? I used to do the same thing until God showed me something on this. He said, you have asked a hard thing. However, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. I want you to watch me be taken away. That's a big reason there. And they, and they still went on and talked, and behold, a chair of fire and a horse, horse of fire, the part of the two, two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. <coughs> and Elijah saw it. He cried, My father, my father, my Abba, my Abba, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He rendered off his old self and put on the new self. Notice this is my Abba, my Abba. That's important too. He took up his mantle of Elijah and that fell from him and he went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle and that fell from Elijah and struck the waters and said, Where, the Lord, where is the Lord the God of Elijah? And, he, and when he had struck the waters, they departed this way and that, and that and Elijah went over. All right? That's where my story kind of ends. Notice that Elijah was supposed to go on by himself. 
right? He said, God sent me, not you, but me, right? You stay here. Well, yeah, he went with him anyways. Elijah, in Hebrew, means my God's salvation. It actually comes from the Hebrew word Yeshua. Kind of interesting, right? Yeshua. Elijah did more miracles than anyone else in the Bible besides Jesus. Look it up. And I'm talking about miracles, I mean good things. A lot of people talk about miracles, they also talk about the bad things too. So I'm going to separate the two. Miracles are good. All your, kind, all your stuff is bad. Okay? He did more miracles. He did more bountiful stuff, good things, than anybody else in the whole entire Bible. Besides Jesus. Jesus did more stuff than no book in the world. He wrote everything he did, the world could not contain all the books. Right? Elijah's ministry, Elijah's ministry, condemned people. We saw that fireball from from heaven coming down, killing people. He destroyed an entire city that rejected him. I mean, there was just nothing left and right. He made the earth. He said, no rain shall come. He condemned people left and right. Kind of sounds like the law. Because the law condemns. When you fall short, there's punishment. All right? You have to be punished. But while Elijah's ministry saved, healed, cleansed, and made provision, etc., Actually, he cleansed a leper. He was actually a foreshadow of Christ. One of the most famous healings that I, I saw, not with the little boy, who, who's the mother, the mother was childless, and Elijah was coming through the town. He made, she made a house for him. He, he, she had a child, and he blessed her with a child. And the child fell and got his head and, and was dying. And he ended up dying. The child died, right? And they got Elijah, and Elijah came back. It says that he laid on top of him, right? Right, right, or, right. Look at the Hebrew. He says that he stretched out his hands and laid on top of them. What's that picture of? The cross. The boy was healed. He was he he was brought back from the dead by the cross. That's so beautiful, isn't it? I love when God starts bringing stuff out for us. We see Jesus Christ right there, and you see that more in, in Elijah's ministry than any other ministry that was ever on this earth. Elijah's ministry represented the condemnation of the law. Represent the law. Elijah's ministry re represented the new covenant grace. And on the grace, we have a double portion of the Spirit. Because the Spirit is not upon us, it's also inside of us. Right? We, the church, without the law, we watch it pass away. Now we're able to step into our double portion. And from that point, healing, cleansing, provision, People being saved is then manifested before us. More greater than anything else. Remember Jesus said, you shall do more works than what I have done? Well, yes, guess what? There's a million of us. And we step out of the law and step fully into grace. We'll do more works than he's done. And it's because that's what Jesus wanted. He wants to get out of the law and get into grace. We saw the law was never meant for us. And it wanted to disappear when Jesus came on the scene. Jesus was there. Grace is here. We're no longer under law, but we're under grace. 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 Understand that. And by that, we have a double portion and we have more glory. And in that, we can do more. And we can then be that church above it that sits on the hill. We can be in Mount Zion where everybody looks up to us and sees us and says, there's hope. And all this world destruction, we see it, man. It's getting bad out there. I'm talking about really bad. It's getting horrible. I, so much as being a pastor, I, I do look at the news. I get so that I can now tailor my ministry towards that. Because there's so many broken people out there. I want to reach those broken people and tell them, you are love and accept it here. Because you know what? There's Jesus here. Right? I see it, but man, it gets dim, man. Sometimes I have to walk away and God said, please just, just help me, man. Help me look at this and see where, where you want to point. But man, it's getting awful out there. Absolutely awful. That plane went down this past week? It has, it has to be horrible. Because families are broken. Who's going to step up? Relief? People? The world? Government? No, it's going to be the church. And as soon as we understand this grace, that the grace that we live in, and it's not by law that we live in, but it's by grace and grace alone, then we can actually be what the world's looking for. You know, in heaven, it did, in, in Revelations, it never said, John said, there's so many people I can count. 
He says, it's so numerous, I can't even count. And God even said, so because, because Abraham never counted the stars and never counted the sands of the, sands of the beach, right? He never counted. God says, so numerous shall your seed be. Mm. Understand that. There's, there's a million of us, and so many people who don't even know that. And we, we condemn people because we say, well, they must not be in Christ. I'm saying they must not know Jesus. They might be saved, but they just don't really know who Jesus really is. They were made actually guys. I was talking to my wife. I said, Carrie, P- Carrie Perry started out in the church singing. Mm-hmm. Now she's doing what she's doing. I'm going to say right now, she doesn't really know who God truly is. Because you know what? She must have grew up in a church ministry that taught the law. It made her not know who really God is. Because if you know who God really is and that he is love, that he is grace, why would you want to go anywhere else? Why would you want to do anything else but want to give and help and reach people with the lost and help the broken? Why would you want to go out and sin? It says the reason why we people go out to lust of the world and do all that stuff is because they don't understand God's the Father's love for them. And by us stepping out of the law and back into this grace and bringing a revival out and bringing us back to grace itself, now we can truly reach those people who are lost and see those people and bring them in and says, come home. I want to show you who truly God truly is. We see that so much, right? Justin Bieber is another example of that. We condemn them. Why? Why? They just don't know God's love for them. It's so powerful. That man who I read the testimony found that God loved them so much. He's stepping out of that addiction. He's leaving it behind. For me, it was instantaneous. I said, I'm in. I'm in this love. I am done with pornography. I'm done with sleeping around. And first ever, first time ever, I had a, a non-sexual relationship with a woman, and I married her. Guys, love. This man, he's slowly dripping it out. He's slowly knowing. He's walking away. He's telling, talk, preaching the gospel to his parents who were Jewish. That's amazing. I bet you all had the moments when you knew that God loved you, that Jesus died on the cross for you, you accepted Jesus Christ. Why do we say that his love is not powerful enough to bring us out? It's the goodness of God that leads us to repent. Not the law. His goodness. His goodness allows us to change our mind. Because you know what? When we don't deserve it, we see his love. It still comes and we don't have to separate from it. We see his love. We say, oh my God, you love me. Why do I want to go out and do anything else? I was brought that up last week. And it's the first time it ever happened to me then. Preaching says, shall we sin so that grace may abound? And the answer is no. Because you know what? If you truly don't understand God's love for you, you don't want to go out and sin. You don't want to go out and make those mistakes. Why? Because God loves you. And when we fully understand that, we can, we can understand that we're no longer in the law. Because the law that God's love was not there. It was cold. Two stone tablets means coldness. It was given through a third party. It wasn't given by God himself. But this grace, this truth, this love of God came by God himself. And this is the love. And we need to look at his love. I'm devoted to myself as a pastor to show each and one of you guys love every single time you're here. To show you Jesus Christ because that's the manifestation of God's love. Him dying on the cross is God's love for you and I. It is manifested and brought before us for all to see. And it's amazing. And Paul said, I only want to know Christ. Mentioned he, he said Christ. And Christ crucified. That's it. Christ alone. Him being crucified. That's God's love. That's all I want to know. And that's all I want to preach. Because in that, it's just God's love. His grace. Where you see His grace, you see God's fullness of His love. And when you see His love, fullness of love, you see His grace. They're one and the same. And as soon as we understand that, man, we can walk out and be the hope of the world. Understand that. That's where we need to be. And I'm devoted by God to bring this out to each and one of you guys every single day through the sermons, through everything. By posting on our Facebook page, by Twitter, it doesn't matter. I'm devoted to tell people about the gospel because you know what? He done that for me. And I want to give out. And I've seen so many of y'all, as y'all seen Jesus, man, y'all just want to give. And y'all want to share that with others. Well, it's time. Let's step out of the law. Let's let the law go. The law is all about your self-efforts, about you. Grace is all about Jesus. Let's see Jesus. Let's, let's stay in there and say, you did it. You've done it all. I receive it all. I walk in that. Stuff comes up. It says, Jesus, your work is finished. I'm not going to try to do this. 
I'm not going to try to earn these blessings and what. Because you know what? Ephesians 1 3 says, You've already been blessed with everything in Christ Jesus. You've already been blessed with it. God has already given it when you were not worthy of it. Therefore, it's by grace. Right? So it's by His finished work everything will manifest. He says, I will work through you to bring out what I already put in you. That is God's promise to you and I. Does that mean we sit in bed all day and sleep? No, why would you want to? If God has loved you so much, why not you go out? And when God leads and directs you, He's leading you to see the manifestation of what He's already blessed you with and given you. Not just to bless you, but to be a blessing to others, to pour out. He gives to you so you can give to Him. You give to others. It's not that we give to God, because we actually don't have anything to give to God. But He gives everything. He gave His own, his own Son with Him. He gives us everything. Not just to give to us, but to give to others to make us a blessing as He promised Abraham. I will bless you to be a blessing to others. That's who we are in Christ. That's who we are.